it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, John Mortis, who's our speaker today. Uh, uh, John has, was, has been and continues to be a close friend and colleague for the last 40 years. Uh, and in that time, he's, he's always wanted to consider new approaches to type 1 diabetes. And uh, in the last, oh, what, 10, 15 years, he's uh, learned about and exercised his, his, uh, his interest in uh, type 1 diabetes genetics. And he's, he's uh, accumulated a worldwide uh, uh, collection of colleagues from California and all the way to Sweden, um, Denmark, and uh, with uh, uh, Libby Blankenhorn, who's on, on this call from Philadelphia, uh, they've made real inroads in understanding type 1 diabetes genetics. Um, it really shows how, uh, you know, if you have an interest, you have an inclination, uh, and you have intellectual curiosity, how you can expand what you want to do, and then add advance to advances in uh, diabetes. So uh, I just wanted to make that comment because we really esteem his, uh, his pursuit of this problem. Okay, John, you're on. Well, thank you, Neil, for your very kind words. And I'm happy to, um, to get started here. So we're gonna talk a little bit about genetics of type one diabetes. Um, I have a micro prelude here that I wanted to mention to people, which is that I don't have any financial conflicts. Um, and I also wanted to say that this is actually an endocrine grand rounds that's masquerading as a fellows research conference. And these fellows research conferences were, they are really um, a requirement of the uh, funding authorities or this accreditation authorities for the fellowship program. And they're really intended to introduce the fellows to the work that, that the faculty that they're working uh, with uh, are engaged in doing. So they're a bit different from standard research conferences. The emphasis I think here is gonna be a little bit more on the history and on the uh, intellectual background, which I think Neil was trying to allude to. Um, so for those of you like Dr. Leiter and Dr. Blankenhorn, I hope you will excuse the fact that I'm uh, going to negotiate the, uh, the, uh, the narrow path between uh, telling a story and doing hardcore research. I want to start by mentioning the collaborators who are here. Um, Dr. Blankenhorn has been my collaborator for nearly 30 years now. She's at the Drexel University College of Medicine. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, she's been part of all of the studies, and we're going to talk today about human and rodent studies both. So those that have been involved in both human and rodent also include Oka Lernmark, who is at Lund University in Sweden and Brian Pierce, who was at UMass and is now down at the University of Maryland. For the human studies, I need to give a special shout out to Uskan Eidemer, uh, who is uh, here at the medical school. He, after a brief um, uh, passage at uh, Brown University, and um, I owe him an enormous debt of gratitude for the analyses of the human data that I'm going to show you later on. Uh, his mentor was Jeffrey Bailey, who is still down at Brown University. And uh, I need to acknowledge Janelle Noble, who is uh, one of the world's authorities in the major histocompatibility complex, who gave us some of the seminal ideas for how to do all of this. Um, when this research all started, I was in the diabetes division and um, it was uh, Aldo Rossini, the, who, the late Aldo Rossini, who was the chief who, uh, gave the uh, green light to doing this stuff, which was uh, actually um, inspired uh, in its very early estate by Dale Greiner, who is still in the um, Diabetes Center of Excellence, and uh, by um, Jean Leaf, who was the chief technician for decades up in the diabetes group, who was responsible for many of the things that I'll point out to you today. Uh, an early mentor and helper in my work was uh, George Eisenbarth, uh, who also unfortunately has passed away. Um, but he had some major insights into type 1 diabetes genetics that uh, led to 
uh, what we're going to be talking about. And then I'll be talking about a study called Teddy and Hemang Pari uh, is uh, key in having made the data that we need available to us. And like everybody else, I'm indebted for funding. And the other person that I want to acknowledge is uh, Dr. Aronin, who has uh, given me the freedom to pursue this stuff while I'm here. So uh, this is the outline of what we're going to do. There'll be a, I'm going to talk about a case, but not in the normal way that we present a diagnostic dilemma and a solution. It's going to be a diagnostic conundrum without a solution. And uh, I hope you find that interesting and in how it affected my uh, interest in this area. So we'll talk a little bit about background and then it's gonna be a three part story about many years of collaborative research, genetic discoveries within the rodent world, and then our initial efforts to translate those discoveries to um, meaningful research on type one diabetes in humans. And then in the last part, um, a progress report on our newest observations, which are really brand new and we're just made public a couple of weeks ago. So this is the case. Um, it's actually a case of two individuals, Kristen and Karen. And she was referred to the UMass Diabetes Clinic for evaluation of glycosuria in 1983. Um, maybe the fellows were not around then, um, but she was referred because uh, at the age of 11, she developed glycosuria. There was nothing at all remarkable about her history, but she did have an identical twin sister named Karen. Uh, there was no family history of diabetes, and it was completely serendipitous finding that she had glycosuria without ketonuria at an annual checkup. And at the time, Karen was totally asymptomatic and normal glycemic. And the question that I was interested in is what's going on here? Um, did Kristen actually have type 1 diabetes? Was she going to progress from glycosuria? Um, did she have genetic uh, uh, components that would... Uh, lead us to believe that it was inevitable and was there anything that we could do what was going on here. Um, so it was a case like Karen's that made me uh, wonder about really what was happening. So let's start with a, beast, a brief bit of review. Uh, we do know a lot about type one diabetes. The lesion is highly beta cell destruction. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. There's abrupt onset of ketoacidosis when roughly 90% of the beta cells are gone. You can find autoantibodies indicative of antecedent autoreactivity for many years beforehand. Uh, median age of onset is still around 14, but the range we now know goes anywhere from a month to 50 plus years. Uh, the prevalence in the United States is about 0.8%. And in to, to the first approximation, men and women are both equally affected. And the pathophysiology, in my view, is that this is a T-cell-mediated autoimmune disease. Um, Sally Kett, who is on this uh, on the Zoom, uh, has devoted a lot of her career to looking at the T-cells that are, in fact, involved in this process. Uh, they infiltrate the islets, causing insulitis. Uh, we know that you can actually adoptively transfer this disease with uh, bone marrow. And we know, although we don't do this anymore because it's too toxic, that you can reverse the disease with cyclosporin. And I always like showing this because this is, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. This is what a normal Eidelberg Langerhans looks like. Dr. Harlan showed you many uh, examples of these in his talks. And this is what happens when you get type 1 diabetes. The arrow points to uh, a typical small round cell with uh, sparse uh, cytoplasm. Uh, that is a T cell. And this is a picture from Willie Gepps, who was really one of the first people who described the autoimmune basis of uh, type 1 diabetes. So what do we know about the genetics? We know it's polygenic and it's non-Mendelian to a big extent. 40% of the risk is attributable to the class 2 major histocompatibility complex loci, which in humans are called the human leukocyte antigen loci, HLA, DR3, and DR4. Uh, account for this 40% susceptibility. And the odds ratio of getting diabetes, type 1 diabetes, if you have one or uh, the other or both of these, is nearly seven. And there is no other genetic element that's nearly as powerful. But note that it's still only 40%. And environmental factors are strongly suspected, but unfortunately still not proven, and I'll come back to this, to convert genetic susceptibility to overt diabetes. And these environmental factors run the gamut from viruses, which um, 
uh, Jennifer Wong in the diabetes group is continuing to research uh, to toxins to dietary factors like uh, cow's milk. And the other interesting fact is that perhaps up to 25% or more of monozygotic twins, uh, such as the twins that I talked about in that case, remain discordant for diabetes. And uh, that is, does that mean it's purely environmental or are there other genetic factors that are involved? And then the other thing that's so fascinating that I'm going to come back to at the end is that the common autoimmune so-called fellow traveler diseases of type one diabetes that you see in a lot of the kids with the disorder are also associated with HLA-DR3 and foremost among them are autoimmune thyroiditis, celiac disease, and vitiligo. So I like to look at the pathogenesis as having, you know, two, a way of, two ways of looking at it. First, the macro way and the micro way. And um, the picture on the left here is that it was developed by uh, George Eisenbarth um, uh, and published decades ago, but still has a huge amount of truth embedded in it. You start this whole process of type 1 diabetes with some form of genetic predisposition, then there may be a precipitating event. Then you're able to detect immunologic abnormalities, largely in the form of autoantibodies. But during this time, things are still normal. Um, but then there become, then there is progressive loss of beta cells, uh, leading eventually to uh, the loss of um, good control. There's uh, overt diabetes. And then finally, a stage where there is little or no C peptide left. And you see this picture of end stage islets, which comes after the insulitis that I showed you. This is a cartoon that outlines what most people think is behind, in simplistic terms, what pe most people think is behind uh, type 1 diabetes. It's a process whereby there is some beta cell antigen, which is taken up by antigen presenting cells shown over here. Those antigen presenting cells present this antigen to the immune system on class 2 HLA molecules. And these are recognized by T cells of one form or another, which uh, interact with one another, leading to recognition of beta cells and then beta cell destruction. Um, the little uh, ellipse that I've drawn in here illustrates something that I'm going to come back to in our discussion of the genetics, which is the so-called trimolecular complex, which is made up of an MHC molecule, either on the APC or the beta cell, an antigen, which we still don't know what it is, and the T cell receptor, which is a complex molecule that's expressed on all of the T cells. And uh, I just decided a long time ago that the most interesting thing for me and the most approachable thing for me uh, with guidance from uh, Dr. Greiner and Dr. Blankenhorn was to look at the genetic predisposition because this is the most upstream place. If we understand this, maybe we can actually prevent the disease rather than do what we're doing brilliantly now, which is treating it. So what are the things that we don't know? Well, we know that only fewer than 10% of the people who have the highest risk HLA genotype will actually go on to develop diabetes. That genotype is the compound heterozygous DR3 and DR4. Um, and there are reports of very high risk, genetic um, risk in, for type 1 diabetes and siblings who share what's described as an extended HLA DR haplotype, DR plus something else in that region. And um, it indicates that there, are, there have to be other genetic risk elements that are there. But so far, we have very, very little information on what those additional genetic risk elements might be. Um, outside of the class 2 MHC or HLA region, there are a few class 1 loci that have an impact on diabetes susceptibility. The so-called VNTR region, which is spelled out for you down here, it's upstream of the insulin gene, is probably has regulatory activities and is the second most powerful determinant of uh, diabetes with a, um, an odds ratio for diabetes of around two and a half. Uh, PTA, PN22, CD25, these are immune related molecule, but they have ratios that are greater than one and a half, but less than two and a half. And what's really fascinating is that there are now, at the last time I looked in a publication that came out last summer, 
uh, from Steve Rich, there are now more than 78 additional statistically significant, and this is the definition of significance in human genetics, loci uh, related to diabetes. But these all have ratios, odds ratios that are less than a half, and much, much less than uh, 1.5. And in the main, these are immune mediated, immune response mediated genes. And this is a cartoon that I, that I got from, um, it was a diagram put together by Philippe Poussier in Canada, uh, who is also a type one diabetes researcher. And it just illustrates a picture is worth a thousand words. You can just see up here how much more powerful the HLA is than anything else in determining diabetes susceptibility. Uh, down here is class one, the insulin gene, the VNTR, the insulin gene. And this, this area of low bars on the right-hand side can continue out for two or three more slides, which I'm not going to show you. Okay, so this is um, the first 20 years of diabetes genetics at UMass. And the only, and I would point out to Neil that actually um, it goes back more than 10 or 15 years. It goes back to the mid 1990s. And uh, when we were doing uh, when I got interested in this, we wanted to find genes that were outside of the MHC that contributed to type 1 diabetes. And we were going to do this because we were an animal shop. We were going to do it in inbred animal models to simplify the work. And one of the beauties of doing this kind of work is that it keeps the major histocompatibility complex constant. You don't have to worry about three DR3 and four and maybe some extended haplotypes. The MHC is constant. And we wanted to understand better how all of those genetic elements might work. And in the process of doing that, we were also investigating how the environment may act because we used a, a model of environmentally or chemically triggered uh, diabetes. And with due apologies to Dr. Leiter, we opted to work in the rat. And this was in large measure due to the fact that uh, Dr. Rossini and Dr. Art Like, who used to be the head of uh, diabetes pathology here at UMass, had focused on this animal model after it was discovered in the 1980s and brought it to UMass, enabling this kind of research to take place. So with all due apologies to the NOD mouse, I will continue uh, to tell you a little bit about what we did here. Uh, this started in the 1990s with Dr. Greiner and uh, Jean Leaf in the technical area and Libby at Drexel. And Libby had countless collaborators down there that I can't name in the time I have here. Um, and what we did was we decided to look at what are called co-isogenic rats that did or did not have autoimmune diabetes. And what we mean by this is that we looked at a couple of different kinds of rats. We had so-called BBDR or diabetes resistant rats and their ancestral strain, the Wistar Firth rats. These rats are MHC identical, but only the BBDR rat became diabetic after you perturbed its immune system, either with an actual virus or something that looked like a virus or by depletion of regulatory T cells. And we liked this because it was a model of uh, gene environment interaction, and it looked very much like on a phenotypic basis, like human type one diabetes. And so what we did is something that was a classic strategy back then, and is still being used now in some places, which is to cross the resistance and the susceptible rats. And what we did in this collaborative effort is that when we did this, we identified progeny that got diabetes after we perturbed them. Very few of them did at the beginning. Um, and then Libby, uh, using genetic methodology that is now kind of antique and doesn't need to be explained for today's purposes, we mapped genetic region and the diabetic animals that came from the BBDR region, which seemed to engraft diabetes susceptibility onto the Wistar Firth rat. And we then back crossed these new rats to the resistant strain, looking to purify them for the diabetes causing genetic elements. And what you do is you repeat this for years and years to create a congenitic rat. And in this congenitic rat, is almost entirely a diabetes resistant Wistar Firth rat but it has just enough of the, the allelic BB diabetes resistant genes to make it diabetes susceptible. And as I said, I had many collaborators who helped make this happen over the years. And I'm just gonna show a couple of the data slides that make the point of where this effort took us. So here's a real fundamental summary of the congenic rats. Uh, 
this shows what happens in terms, this is a Kaplan-Meier plot where you show how many of the rats remain non-diabetic if you go straight across the top or become diabetic, uh, become sick uh, uh, as you go down on the curve, a classic, classic Kaplan-Meier plot. And we're looking at two uh, congenic animals here. This, the designations are not important other than to note that one is W and one is D. These animals are identical except for two and a half bag at this stage of the research, we're identical except for two and a half megabases of DNA from the BBDR rat on chromosome four. And what you see here is that when you test the Worcester Firth rats for their diabetes susceptibility, almost none of them become diabetic, whereas half of those that were at this stage of the analysis, half of those that had the genes that were responsible for diabetes did become diabetic. And through a very sophisticated process of continuing uh, uh, fine mapping, so-called, uh, we took this two and a half megabyte interval, megabase interval here, uh, which contains lots of uh, genetic elements. And what we did is, or Libby did, because I have to credit her with all of this heroic effort, we identified a gene here, TCRB, which is a T cell receptor beta chain variable region gene, specifically TCRBV13, as the likely gene that conferred susceptibility. And what it turned out was that one allele of this gene encodes T cells that are V beta 13A. And you find these in all of the BB rats. Whereas in the Worcester Firth rat, there's an allelic variant and it's V beta 13B. And these uh, two TCR beta chains differ at five non-synonymous um, non residues in the TCR beta chain. And this was exciting to me, although Dr. Greiner said that he uh, um, mourned the fact that this of all the things that we could possibly find seemed to be the gene of interest because it's such a complicated business. So this is a picture of that trimolecular complex in a little bit more detail. It's made of three things the class two MHC, which in the rat we know exactly what it is. And down here, the T cell receptor, which is made of an alpha chain, a beta chain. And here you see the beta chain variable gene uh, product, V beta. And this is where our research uh, landed us. This trimolecular complex is central to type one diabetes pathogenesis. Up here, the MHC accounts for 40% of the risk as I've mentioned. There's an antigen right in the middle of this complex that has to direct this thing towards beta cells. We don't know exactly what it is at all. Uh, most thinking is that it's likely to be an insulin fragment, although there are other candidates. The most likely candidate that Dr. Eisenbarth uh, researched extensively over the years was this piece of the uh, insulin B chain, uh, residues nine through 23. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So the TCR completes this trimolecular unit. And as you know from your studies of, of uh, basic uh, immunobiology, this is the product of VDJ recombination. Um, and what we found was that susceptibility was not in the variable region up here where the VDJ recombination gives you lots of variability, but in the hard-coded part of the beta chain V region here, not the variable, not the hypervariable part up here. And this was a surprise because, you know, it's said that there are, it's calculated that there are more than 10 to the 15th possible VDJ rearranged TCRs. So why did you need one specific one to get diabetes? Uh, it had not ever been thought that a genomically encoded part of the TCR was likely to be a key therapeutic product. But it turns out that in the rat, that seems to be the case. And what's nice about the rat is there are lots of different flavors of rats that you can look at, both for their diabetes susceptibility, their MHC, and their T cell receptors. And here's a summary table that we put together in uh, 2012. Here are five different rat kinds of rats, rat strains, all related. Um, all of these up here in gray get diabetes. These down here in red don't. Um, all of these that get diabetes have the class 2U MHC. Down here, and those that don't get diabetes, well, here's one that has class 2N. And try as we might, this classic brown Norway rat does not get diabetes. But in addition, what you find is that 
If you have V-beta 13A plus class 2U, you get diabetes. Whereas if you have V-beta 13B, as is the case in the Wistar Firth, you don't get diabetes. And in the Fisher 344 rat, if V-beta 13 is a pseudogene, then you also do not get any diabetes. So non-class 2U rats develop, no non-class 2U, RT1U rats develop T1B, RT1U being the equivalent of HLA-DR3 in uh, the rat. And V-beta 13 seems to account for a good half of all the susceptibility in these animals. Okay. Okay. And this is where it got to be really kind of interesting and exciting because if a T cell receptor is important, then you might be able to get rid of those particular T cells and prevent diabetes in those animals that have the right MHC also. And so we were blessed. We uh, were gifted uh, a couple of monoclonal antibodies that had been developed in Europe. And we had an antibody that was directed against V-beta-13 and another one that was directed against V-beta-16, an irrelevant TCR. And what you can see in this graph is if you treat these diabetes-resistant animals with poly-IC, which is like a virus, um, you can take the animals that only get treated with poly-IC and the dots here make most of them diabetic. You can take them and treat them with either an, an irrelevant rat antibody or even a human anti-T cell antibody, and they still all get diabetic. But if you deplete their V-beta 13A positive T cells, you largely prevent diabetes. And you know this was fascinating to us, and it was a very powerful observation. We also showed it in other kinds of rats, including the BBVP rat, which gets spontaneous diabetes. And then this was the final installment of our UMass TCR story that I'm going to show you. Um, we actually were able to make a knockout of the V-beta-13 locus in the rat. And as you can see here, if you have no V-beta-13 genes, uh, you completely prevent diabetes, whereas those that uh, do not have the knockout go on to develop it. Uh, in this particular case, we extended our argument a little bit more powerfully by using yet a different kind of rat that gets diabetes with the right MHC and the right P-beta-13. And um, this is the most recent thing that we have had uh, come out in our story of rat diabetes. Um, and so what we have is something that's unique so far in the analyses of type 1 diabetes. We've identified definitively two of the four components of a diabetogenic trimolecular complex. We, have, we know what the MHC is, and we had now knew what half of the T cell receptor, ha, T cell receptor had to be. And we also had clues as to what might be the alpha chain from work that George Eisenbarth had done in the NOD mouse. And also clues as to what the peptide might be due to work also of George Eisenbarth, his colleagues, and many other people. Uh, so this is in a level of immunological detail of the trimolecular complex in T1D that really is still only known in the rat. This is a cartoon that I'm going to show you to tell you what this kind of information allows us to do without actually having the time to tell you in detail what all of this means. And this is work that um, I'm indebted to Brian Pierce, who was at UMass when he uh, did this and continued the work actually after he moved to Maryland. Brian is an expert in modeling T cell receptors and uh, MHC molecules and many other things uh, uh, using very powerful techniques. This, these ribbon diagrams over here that I'll explain in just a second were made with a program called Moleta, um, Rosetta. And they used the fact that we knew what the MHC was, which is down here, it's RT1 B of U. We knew what the TCR beta chain was, which is shown up here in uh, magenta. We used an alpha chain that was plausible, V alpha five, and we used the peptide. And when Brian ran these things through, he was able to generate very plausible TCR, MHC, antigen, trimolecular complexes um, that were energically favorable. They came in a couple of different flavors, but this one over here, and I'm not gonna try to show you what they are. Uh, right down here, you see in pink is the, um, this is the uh, insulin peptide that's presented by the class two molecule. And here's the T cell receptor sitting up here. Uh, these two models, A and B, the B one's really interesting because if you look at this, you can see that compared to A, the T cell receptor here is a little bit tilted. 
And this tilted trimolecular complex configuration, uh, the TCR sitting at an angle on the MHC peptide complex, has actually been described in X-ray crystallographic studies by two groups, uh, including Kai Volkerfenig at Harvard in multiple sclerosis and another group that looked at celiac disease. So I thought that this was, you know, this for me was very fascinating because it allowed us to begin to speculate about what these interactions uh, might uh, actually entail. So using inbred rats, we were able to um, find two genes critical for T1D. It gave us some clues as to how the pathogenesis might occur. Um, you know, immunobiologists like Dr. Kent might be able to explain how a tilted low affinity might binding in the thymus might predisposed to the release of autoreactive cells that shouldn't be there. Um, and that to me was fascinating. So that's an interesting part of the story. I don't wanna say, I don't wanna imply of course that we had the whole story. We, have, we found other genes that had minor roles including UBASH3 and UBD and there are others. Uh, the T cell receptor uh, beta chain only accounts for about 50% of the susceptibility. But what was fascinating is that even that being the case, despite the disorder being polygenic, we found a way to prevent it by targeting the product of just one of the genes that was involved. And so we wanted to know, uh, was there something similar in human diabetes uh, that had been missed? Because no one had come up with this, even though a lot of very powerful studies had been looking at human type one diabetes genetics, people with vastly more resources and knowledge than than our group had. So to move, we wanted to move our rat genetics to stu human studies. And uh, to do this, this was a suggestion that uh, was made by several people and really uh, solidified by our uh, collaboration with Janelle Noble. What we did is we stratified our human samples by high-risk HLA genotype. The human HLA is a huge amount more complicated than that which you've seen in the rat. Uh, but by looking at one T1D DR haplotype, we could simplify our analysis. And it was a way of perhaps, you might say, approximating an inbred human. Uh, and we hoped that by doing this, we could understand better such questions as why HLA three and four are powerful determinants of risk, but are nonetheless insufficient to cause the disease. Uh, and we just thought we might identify genetic additional determinants that modulate the high-risk HLA BR3 and 4 haplotypes. And of course, our heart was set on finding a T cell receptor that was married to HLA BR3. So to do this, uh, we were uh, blessed to receive from my collaborators DNA from the Type 1 Diabetes Genetics Consortium. These were all samples that had been typed by Janelle Noble and also uh, uh, another uh, Swedish sample provided to us by Dr. Oka Lernmark. And all of these DNA samples were probed uh, and sequenced using something called molecular inversion probes. Um, Jeff Bailey and Oskan Eidemer were the ones who were behind getting all of this done. Um, molecular inversion probes is a very economical way of doing a lot of high throughput sequencing of multiple genes. It's very pretty, but I don't have time to tell you how it works today. And we had in this initial study, uh, a thousand cases of which 365 were uh, persons, DNA from persons with diabetes and 668 from non-diabetic controls. We were hoping to find uh, T cell receptor genes. So we developed probes that would find all of the T cell receptors that were known in him. But we took the opportunity because of the power of molecular inversion probes or MIPS, we studied more than 50 other known T1D susceptibility regions that had been published. And of course, you never find what you're looking for, you find something else. So we serendipitously discovered something that we call the tri-SNP. This was three single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs that were located in the intron of a gene in the HLA, uh, intron one of HLA DRA. And we found that it really powerfully discriminated amongst HLA-DR3 homozygous individuals with respect to their T1Ds at risk. You need you know, almost you know, huge numbers of kids with type 1 diabetes have HLA-DR3, but most people with DR3 don't get the disease. 
So let me tell you a little bit about the TRISNF in this initial work, which was published uh, only about two years ago now. So this is a little bit of background on understanding how we approach this. Single nucleotide polymorphisms in the human genome have these designations, big numbers prefixed with an RS. And there are reference alleles based on the uh, thousand genomes of the Human Genome Project. And in our case, the reference alleles for R3 SNPs were A, C, and G. And in our samples that were in these HLA-DR3 positive individuals, we had alternate alleles. Um, so what we did is we used something that we kind of invented as a vector notation. We called the reference allele zero uh, because I find ACG hard to digest and keep in my head. And we called the alternate allele one. And what we discovered in our work was that there was a risk haplotype, which was O1O with respect to these three SNPs, and a protected haplotype that we designated as 101. So these tri SNP, these three SNPs that we analyzed are, as I said, in an intron of HLA DRA. And what we discovered was that the odds ratio for individuals homozygous for the 101 haplotype, the protective haplotype was 0.22. This is the inverse of a susceptibility allele. And it was very significant. I told you that 10 to the minus eighth will get you uh, statistical significance in most genetics research. This was significant at the 10 to the minus 13th level relative to persons who had HLA-DR3 with the risk haplotype 010. And this is what it looks like. This is a picture of the relevant parts of the HLA-DRA gene. It has um, five exons. Here is intron one. And these three SNPs are distributed along here. How did we find these SNPs? Molecular inversion probes actually enabled us to sequence in two directions across this. We only knew about one of these SNPs from the prior literature. The molecular inversion probes were what serendipitously enabled us to put all of this together. No one had actually uh, uh, looked for it. So this is interesting. So you've got, an, uh, this is another example of an intron that seems to be affecting a, a disease. And how do introns do that? How does the quote unquote junk DNA make a difference? And we don't know, but uh, what Dr. Blankenhorn and her colleagues uh, came up with in Philadelphia was that it could be functioning as an EQTL. EQTL it stands for expression quantitative trait locus. In other words, something that has a variable effect on gene expression, okay? And it's a region of the genome that affects the expression of other genes. And the genome, these EQTLs, these gene regions of the genome that seem to have the ability to regulate other parts of the genome, uh, they've been mapped. They are not for sure, but they have characteristics that make them good candidates for doing that. So what we were able to, what Libby did was she uh, probed uh, various databases in which this information is available. These three big red arrows here point to the SNPs that we have of interest. Up here, you find likelihood probabilities that there may be a there could be a possibility of an EQTL function. And it turns out that in the Thousand Genomes Project, some people within the, who donated DNA to the Thousand Genomes, their DNA was also analyzed for its EQTL activity. There are not a lot of 101s and 010s with HLA-DR3 in the uh, Human Genomes Project. But what we were able to do was to um, take a few of these samples out, 010 homozygotes, 101 homozygotes, and then heterozygotes. And it's not important to know what your, the magnitude of what here or the measurement units are. This is a log scale, so these differences are bigger. But what you see is that there are some differences. And what these particular differences are, are in the level of expression of HLA uh, genes, HLA, DQ, DR, DD, DQ, B1. These are all relevant to the pathogenesis of autoimmune disorders. And it gives us some clues as to what could possibly be going on. Um, we did have some hits. I'm not going to go into the details of what these T cell receptors are, 
we did find some statistically significant associations of DR3, all of our samples being DR3. We found some associations with T cell receptors, but we were disappointed. They were statistically significant, but we didn't think they were really robust. And we wanted to wait before we decided to try to say anything about them. So the last part of my talk here is going to be a kind of progress report. This is what we have been up to and these are analyses that OSCON has actually, uh, find, uh, these are DNA samples that we just received over the course of the summer and analyses that have been performed on these enormous ECF files by OSCON and uh, by Dr. Blankenhorn. Um, we wanted to look at these HLA, we wanted to look at HLAs other than BR3 We wanted to try to confirm our trisnip, you know, it's, is it just a, a one trick pony or is it something that is important uh, in other parts of the world? We wanted to gather additional TCR data. And if possible, we wanted to do things that I wasn't able to do with our original samples, which is look at autoantibodies, celiac disease, which is a co-traveler with type one diabetes and thyroid autoimmunity. And through Dr. Blank and Horton Sweden, we were able to form a collaboration with an enormous study called TEDI. The acronym TEDI stands for the Environmental Determinants of Diabetes in the Young. And it's an enormous study. There are thousands of kids that, are, uh, that were enrolled in the study. There are currently almost 4,000 of them still there. Some have dropped out, some have aged out of the study. Um, it's uh, an NIH funded study, but the, uh, the kids come from Finland, Germany, um, Colombia and South America, and um, in, in the United States. And there's a lot of information here in this TEDI study, not only genetics, which is what we're focusing on, but they have other phenotypes. They know about the type one diabetes oral antibodies, they know about diet. They're doing an awful lot of work on infections that I won't touch on and celiac disease, which I'll come back to and thyroid disease. So why would look at TEDI? Well, TEDI would allow us to confirm and extend our original findings. And we really wanted to do that. Uh, but we were pleasantly surprised is that just as we were doing our analyses of Teddy, a paper came out from Finland, which has the world's highest prevalence of type 1 diabetes and an extraordinarily active type 1 diabetes research community. And they actually confirmed the fact that the trisnip polymorphism that we found affects type 1 diabetes in the Finnish population. So this was very gratifying. We were not all alone in our suppositions out there in regard to human diabetes with this very oddball finding. So we thought it was really reasonable and desire to explore our observations using uh, the Teddy study. And the first thing that has been made available to us by Dr. Um, Parikh, Hemang Parikh, and the Teddy study group is uh, our immunochip data. These, this is a chip, this is a, a uh, a product designed by the Illumina company. The, this one's called the Infinium genotyping tip chip. It contains gazillions of polymorphisms, insertions, deletions, and SNPs that are designed to enable us to do deep replication of uh, what's behind the genetics of uh, autoimmune and other inflammatory diseases. And what I'm gonna show you now in just a few slides is our preliminary findings with the Teddy data. And the first one here is uh, type one diabetes free survival. So this is another Kaplan-Meier plot, a little bit like those that I showed you from the rat. And I'll just try to show you the simple things here. And then at the end call, or in a little bit call to your attention, some caveats that mean motivate us to perform more in-depth analyses. So this is just a simple uh, two variable analysis in which we have the type one diabetes phenotype time, and then our trisnip. And up here is our protective trisnip. And you're looking at the probability of type 1 diabetes survival in the Teddy cohorts so far. This is looking at all DR3 and DR4 subjects in the sample. And there is a highly statistically significant association of the 101 haplotype with some degree of protection from getting type 1 diabetes. So that was great. We now have three confirmation, or we have an original observation and two confirmatory studies that this tristep is telling us something about the genetics of type 1 diabetes in humans. 
We also took where so far we've looked at one of the so-called endophenotypes or other associated pieces of the puzzle, and that's type 1 diabetes autoantigens. Uh, the autoantigen story in type 1 diabetes is complicated. There are five of these, uh, excuse me, autoantibodies. There are five of these autoantibodies. They tend to appear at different times. There are autoantibodies to insulin, to glutamic acid decarboxylase, to a zinc transporter, and others. And this is just a, as it were, naive look at the data from the beginning. And we see the same thing here. Uh, although not hugely significant, there seems to be a protective effect of our 101, 101 trisnip haplotype on the generation of autoantibodies in these kids. There is a lot more to do here, but this was our first pass observation. And it was nice to see that it was consistent with what we might think should be going on. But then just as the trisnip originally was a surprise, the Teddy data, generated another major genetic surprise for us. And that's what happened when we looked at celiac disease. And here, what we're looking at is probability of transglutaminase antibody free survival, okay? Not having celiac disease, according to whether or not you have the trisnip. And lo and behold, it turns out that our resistance trisnip haplotype, the 101 that you see down here, paradoxically confers susceptibility to celiac disease at a very high level of significance in this very preliminary analysis of the data. So we seem to at least be, have begun to scratch the surface of what the, some, some of the subtler aspects of human genetic susceptibility to type 1 diabetes is in particular, and the associated autoimmune diseases uh, for uh, that go along with it and are also associated with TR3. Uh, we do not yet have any analyses of um, thyroid that is coming down the line. And I am hoping that I will be able to establish a, a collaboration with John Harris here at UMass who has access to a separate sample of, set of samples of DNA that would allow us to look for susceptibility to vitiligo. So here are some conclusions. We confirmed the trisnip. Uh, for the second time, following upon the fins of our original findings. Um, we found that there was a protective effect with the autoantibodies. The data were as we expected them to be, but not yet statistically robust. There's more to do, and I'll mention that, how we're going to approach that. Um, the protective effect may be limited to uh, DR3 homozygotes. We don't know that for sure yet. And there are some caveats that, for those of you who Dr. Leiter who, and Dr. Blankenhorn who are into the depth of the genetics, not the fellows, but there are some funny things. There were no diabetics among the 63 DR3 homozygous children in the Teddy study yet. Okay, it may be early days and that meant that we were really unable to do a, an in-depth assessment of type one diabetes risk for the susceptible 01010 homozygous uh, haplotype. And then among the 1,500 DR4 subjects that were in the study, only eight of them had one copy of the protective 101 haplotype. Now, this is kind of interesting. Does that mean that we could explain why HLA DR4 may in fact be the most powerful class two T1D determinant? Because it doesn't travel with that protective haplotype. And that's an interesting mechanistic, mechanistic uh, question to explore. There's a strong effect on celiac disease, but it's in the opposite direction. What is risk reducing in type one diabetes is risk increasing for celiac disease, both HLA DR3 associated disorders and disorders that often exist in the same unfortunate child. Uh, I didn't show you this, but um, we have, this is transglutaminase data that I showed you for celiac disease. It's also the same for clinically diagnosed um, uh, disease, celiac disease. And this may be enable us to begin to scratch the surface, uh, some new insights into why DR3 linked autoimmune diseases are sometimes concordant and sometimes not. So what are we gonna do? The fellows know that in journal clubs, I'm always harping on, 
what statistics are they really using? What statistics are being used to obfuscate the data and what they, statistics are being used to enlighten us? So we have a Teddy associated uh, statistician who's going to be helping us out by doing multivariate time to, anal to pathology um, analyses, Cox variant and Cox proportional hazard analyses. And we're gonna apply this to our findings with respect to T1D uh, celiac disease, and also as the data become available to thyroid disease. And these analyses will be able to enable us to introduce covariates, covariates that include time, could even conceivably include the covariates that are buried, in, embedded within Teddy, including diet and um, infectious disease observations, including especially echo art. Uh, echo viruses. We're also going to have uh, the opportunity to get some more data if we can keep on moving uh, through this, which I think Dr. Ronan has uh, graciously said that he would like to see happen. We have, there's an additional, uh, there are an additional 778 samples uh, for which whole genome sequence data are available. We haven't looked at those yet. And that might enable us to say something about these extended haplotypes and some additional risk loci. Uh, finally, there are transcriptome data, the, MA, the mRNA that has uh, been generated as part of the uh, study. And if we have the transcriptome data, that will enable us perhaps to confirm our speculation that uh, the trisnip may act as an expression QTL, uh, perhaps on class 2 HLA expression or on the expression of other relevant genes. In addition, um, we have initiated, they're very inchoate right now, uh, but we have initiated uh, in vitro studies to actually uh, look at the effect of trisnip on the level of expression, surface level of expression of um, MHC class two on various classes of immunocytes, including T cells, B cells, and uh, antigen presenting cells. And this is all being done in Dr. Lernmark's lab in Lund University in Sweden. We're hoping that we'll find new clues as to why DR3 and 4 heterozygotes are higher risk than either DR3, 3, or 4, 4 homozygotes. And finally, um, we're going to do initial analysis of candidate TCR genes. Those TCR genes were the genetic element that we started out with. And we, um, we're not done with it yet. And hopefully, if time and funding remain with us, uh, we'll be able to uh, return to that question and have something more to say because, again, by depleting a TCR positive T cell subset, we could prevent diabetes in uh, our rats. Um, so I'm going to return to the case now, and Kristen is actually on the call here uh, at my invitation. She's a very gracious and talented young woman. Uh, she's now 48, and I'm sorry if I'm giving away a secret, but I don't think it's really a secret. Uh, she's married, she has a child, a daughter. Um, we did an experiment on her when she presented at age 11. We tra transferred cells from her non-diabetic sibling to her to see if we could prevent diabetes because we were able to do that in rats. But unfortunately, as we have all learned all too often, rats are not humans, and that technique did not prevent her diabetes. So she's had the disorder now for 29 years or so. She's normal weight. She's on pump therapy with CGM. Oh, and I misstated her, her glycohemoglobin. It's not 6.2. I think it's 5.8, she told me on the phone the other day. Uh, her only uh, diabetic complication was detection of retinopathy that she had laser surgery for a long time ago. But as her control has main, maintained fastidiously brilliant, um, there's been no other evidence of complications. And here we return to the mysteries of type one diabetes, genetics and genetics in general. You would have expected her monozygotic twin to become diabetic, or at least to be one of the uh, only 25% or so of kids that didn't become diabetic. But Kristen's monozygotic twin sister who was BRCA1 and BRCA2 negative developed breast cancer and died at the age of 38. So um, go figure. What this all means to me is that there's an awful lot more about type 1 diabetes genetics or in genetics in general to discover um, that you can do so well in treating diabetes now that we really do need to understand those genetic elements that predispose to the uh, disease with a greater degree of certainty than we have now. 
uh, Kristen's HLA haplotype was DR3, DR1. We don't know if her daughter has uh, DR3. And even if her daughter did, her, uh, her daughter's risk is much less than 5%. So uh, this has been, um, for me at least, um, a very difficult pathway to follow for the last 30 years. And I'm left with a more unanswered questions than answered questions. Um, but it's uh, been a fun process. And I hope I've conveyed to the fellow what Neil wanted to convey to the fellows. Uh, if you find a problem um, uh, that's relevant to clinical medicine and you sort of dig at it and establish good collaborations that you can go ahead and do this sort of thing. And with that, I'll stop and take questions. We actually have a few minutes left.